Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the Phase Three Meet series. Uh, delighted you can you can join us again. Um, this week, it's a pleasure to welcome Simon Fowler, uh, the CEO of Exceed. Simon, how are you doing? Uh, doing very well, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, lovely here in Gloucestershire at the moment. Oh, you're making me jealous. I'm I'm sat in Manchester, I'm looking out the window, and it's absolutely heaving down with rain. Uh, I think you, we had that last night. I think we've got the we got the sunshine. I'm sure you'll get it later. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Thank you very much for uh, for joining me today uh, on this session. Uh, let's start as we always do. Why don't you tell uh, us all about Exceed and and what it is you guys do? Sure. Yeah. So um, Exceed is a uh, is the only single solution HR and payroll um, built on the Salesforce platform. Uh, we started about 10 years ago. Um, our, um, our founder, Chris Mitford Slade, um, was a, a HR, global HR director. Um, basically got a little bit fed up of going through the pain of putting in a new solution um, only to find that actually it kind of pretty much did what the, the one before did, but in a slightly different way. Um, so basically we set out to, I suppose if you like, build the world's best employee relationship management um, solution on the world's best CRM solution. Um, basically pushing out everything um, to the employee, making the employee part of the record. So getting away from the transactional HR systems of old um, and making it about the employee and letting them build in, but also, I suppose, freeing up the time for the HR team to actually build relationships work with the business strategically rather than spend their days you know filling out forms and uh, updating address details and things like that yeah i love that and and i love the point you, you, you touched on there about it being really employee centric yeah um and obviously everyone's reading about the war on talent at the moment and the you know what was it 33 percent of your workforce are expected to leave uh, which is a Pretty well. I hope not as well. I, somebody asked me that in, a, in an interview recently, and I'm, uh, asked me if I'm ready for that to happen. I said I'm ready to take on somebody else's 33 <laughs> percent. I see it's an opportunity rather than a threat, but you, you know you can't absolutely. take things for granted. Well, it leads nicely onto the next question about how can Exceed help customers to kind of combat that, I suppose, and and ensure that the, the, their uh, employee retention via the smoother employee experience. Yeah, I think so. I, I just touched on it a second ago. I think. There, there are several ways, and, and it's a great question, which you know is is really everybody is on everybody's mind at the moment. So, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, we are trying to um, have a solution which frees up the HR. We hear about HR business partners, but often we go into um, new customers and we see that actually the HR business partners are kind of HR admin partners. Um, they're just like going through this churn day in, day out, and they're not doing the things which, as we all know, HR people really love doing, which is working with people. So I think, you know, part of what um, Exceed does is free up that time um, for the HR team to really work as a strategic partner with the business and, and, and work with managers around retention and, and stuff like that. And never more important than obviously after after COVID. I said after COVID then, I don't know why. Are we after? <laughs> no, not after, are we? But definitely as a result of COVID, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I think then also, you know, we all know um, that um, as, as we get older, as I get older, uh, the younger generations come into the workforce and what they expect from a solution is, is different to what was expected 10, 20 years ago. And, and I think, you know, streamlined technology, you know, I expect um, myself to have an app that works on my phone. Um, I expect to book my leave and, and do things on the system that I need to do at home when I'm sat around the table with my family. You know, I don't book holiday when I go into the office. Um, I book it when I'm talking to my wife and son and, you know, we're getting excited about it. I don't want to wait till I go in. And I think so it's that sort of streamlined technology, even in the recruiting phase. You know, having a portal that people can go on to upload, find out further information, because it's even competitive, I think, at that at that stage. You know, it used to be that I think you would, you know, you'd get somebody, you'd take them through the interview stages and you were absolutely sure that, you know, if you made them an offer, the likelihood is they would take it. And I think now it is, you know, 
33% of the workforce is looking to leave, it doesn't feel like there's a lot more people in the marketplace. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, recruiting the best talent has never been harder. Um, and so I think that even that from that first impression and with so many interviews being done remotely and things like that now, I think technology is absolutely key to that. Um, and I think also we're seeing and we're, we're sort of trialing um, around AI. There's been a lot of talk about AI and, and on the Salesforce platform, obviously, we one of the benefits of being on it is, is we get the massive investment that Salesforce put into the platform year in, year out. And, and Einstein, as they call it, original name, um, is, um, is their AI. And um, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with a couple of customers really to, to look at how is there a pattern in when people are starting to churn. So if you look at, for instance, performance reviews, holiday patterns, feedback, survey results from individuals that actually have left, can you then apply that quite easily over the rest of your remaining employees and actually see that there are people who possibly you need to do a bit of work with because they're kind of looking like the same sort of conditions as people that have left your business um, previously but obviously our customers don't want to be data scientists. So we've got to find a way to yeah. get that into their hands in a way that makes it really easy to use. Wow, that's so exciting, isn't it? And I think that level of data over your workforce is is, is crucial yeah. when there is that war on talent. And like you say, every single bit of the process from onboarding to when they've onboarded in terms of how, you mentioned it perfectly, how easy it is to book holiday. Yeah. You know, how easy to but leave, what whatever it may be, that is, it needs to be everything needs to be on point now. Yeah, because absolutely. people, uh, uh, people who are who are joining you have options. Yeah, and absolutely. and and you know, flexible working and all the all the rest of the stuff. Now, it it's you've got to have those options available. Otherwise, they'll just look elsewhere. They'll look next door. Yeah, hundred percent. And and you won't know until they you know unless you have the data at your you know at your fingertips and the ability to use it and that I think that's why a, a kind of single solution is so important yeah you know the first thing you you could know about it is a key member of staff working walking out the building or key members of staff working out the building and I think again if as a result of covid what we're seeing is is people's hr strategies they used to be very focused on kind of highly skilled, highly paid people. And I think, you know, if the petrol crisis tells us anything, you know, the operational people in your organization are as critical as the highly paid people. Um, and, you know, if you lose, start losing them at a great rate of knots uh, to a competitor or, or whatever, um, that can just be just as crippling for a business as losing, you know, your highly paid superstars. Absolutely. And that leads nicely onto the next question. You mentioned AI there and kind of, you know, new technology and new ways of working and all that kind of stuff. And obviously you've been in the HR and payroll space a while now, uh, obviously vastly experienced. Uh, what are the kind of major changes you've seen? And I know a lot of it will be based upon the last 18 months and, and everything that COVID has brought along, but even kind of before that, and you can include the COVID stuff as well. But what are the major changes you've seen? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm assuming when you say hugely experienced, you mean old, I said. Um. I, I meant hugely <laughs> experienced. <laughs> okay. uh, for me, I think, um, I mean, I think the HR tech and um, payroll space is as exciting now as it's ever been in, in my sort of like 20 odd years in, in kind of ERP software. Um, so I think, you know, what we were seeing prior to COVID, so COVID has really accelerated things for me. So we were still having conversations which I found really surprising prior to COVID. We were, we were sort of talking, we still had the odd um, prospect in the market who didn't insist on it being cloud-based. Um, it still amazes me that, you know, we I think we'll get to the point where people will start to say, actually, I want a single solution for HR and payroll so that all of my data is in one place, I can report on it, I don't have that complication. Um, and I think we were seeing over the last sort of 15, 20 years, we were seeing the move away from a kind of transactional um, HR payroll piece that was really designed for um, the HR teams um, from an admin perspective. And I think what we've seen, um, and I say accelerated by COVID, is really 
it become all about employee engagement, all about employee experience. We were seeing it before. It's not a COVID thing, um, but it's absolutely accelerated. And obviously the new ways of working make that even more important because you don't run into people at the coffee machine. You know, you don't see one of your guys looking a bit down and you can't, you know, you can't necessarily pull them to one side and say, hey, you know, what's what's going on? Is everything OK with you? You don't get that anymore. So, you know, check in surveys, things like that have just become more important because, you know, you, you jump onto Teams and you jump onto Zoom and, you know, you're all smiley because um, everybody's looking, but actually doesn't necessarily say how you really are. And I think, you know, the systems of, that we are now looking at engagement and experience and the employee experience is absolutely key. And I think that's so exciting. Um, you know, Simon, I, I find it mind boggling that I, I get how COVID has accelerated it. I, yeah. I absolutely agree with what you said, but I, I just can't get my head around the fact that there were some businesses out there and there still are to, some, to, to a lesser degree now that didn't know this pre-pandemic. It, it, how can you not understand that putting your employees at the center of your business will result in a better business? It's it, it just mind boggling to me. It really is. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I can't quote some examples, but, you know, I've seen examples of, you know, global businesses of, of you know, 2,000, 2,500 people, and they're still doing it on paper. They still don't know how many really, how many, well, actually, probably the finance team know how many employees they've got. Um, yeah. You know, and things like that. And, you know, and performance is the other thing. I think, you know, we will now see performance regimes and again we were seeing it before where you know this this horrible annual process annual appraisal yeah everybody yeah. hated it you know you kind of you know prepared for some sort of conflict battle yeah. um and now what we're seeing and is with our performance um, module is that people it's a it's a kind of weekly bi-weekly yeah. monthly sort of process with regular check-ins i mean we can you know uh, exceed with salesforce hugely flexible um we haven't yet found uh, a performance um regime that an organization wants to enforce that we can't we can't configure but we are definitely seeing more people using in the way we would want to use it in fact the way we do use it um, and also you know because it's on the Salesforce CRM of course the interactive nature of it using chatter and things like that is there if people want to use it and it's a, a kind of um, we were talking to one of our customers the other day and they were saying what they really liked is the fact that it's not a it manager does it it's done the way that exceed does it is it, it kind of there is a conversation that happens um, and I think that's, you know, that's all a result of the of the way that the HR space is going at the moment. Yeah, so happy that the annual appraisal stuff. I mean, you know, if you're a footballer, you wouldn't expect your uh, performance to be reviewed once a year. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Or even three or four times. It's got to be an ongoing, constant, you know, yeah. reviewing process, hasn't it? And I it's got to work is. both ways as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think footballers get their appraisal from the, the stands most of the time, don't they? Yeah, on a, on almost minute by minute basis sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's good yeah. or bad. <laughs> and I agree sure. with your point. How did people not realise that this was so important? Yeah. Obviously, but as I say, it, it definitely is the case. So, so moving forward, obviously, there's a lot of challenges we face now um, as we kind of, you know, move on from the, the, the pandemic phase and, and, well, hopefully get through this winter, see where we're at. But as a CEO, what, what are the kind of biggest challenges you think you're going to face now? And, and how do you how do you manage to, to kind of navigate those? So I, I think in terms of um, the Exceed organisation, um, so because obviously I come at it from several um, perspectives. Yep. So uh, from a people perspective, it, it's really about um, keeping our culture. So um, and it's not I don't think you can keep the culture that you had before. Um, because I've heard that said a few times, but actually it's all changed. So I think what you've got to do is define a new culture that suits you, your employees, you know, your, all of your stakeholders. Um, you know, people don't want to return back to the office five days a week. Um, and actually, we don't want them to come back five days a week um, because they've really benefited. And we've, I suppose, if COVID has done anything positive, and I hesitate to say that, it's been a bit of a social experiment, hasn't it? It's like, you know, yeah. we've seen yeah. that things that we thought probably couldn't work, 
with us being more flexible, if we're really honest. So like, for instance, our support teams, we were really worried that if we split them, um, we wouldn't get that interactive um, ability to respond quickly to customer calls because you can just lean to your left and ask somebody a question and I've got this of you, you know, but actually we haven't seen that at all. I think the technology is adapted and, and that hasn't happened. So we don't want to pull those people back into the office because now they can take their kids to school and but and yeah. still start work at probably half past eight or quarter to nine or whatever. Um, so I think it's, it's that is one of the things that we're, we're looking at, how we how we change our culture to be what we want it to be, but actually still give everybody the the, the flexibility yeah. um, to, to, quite frankly, enjoy their yeah. work life balance a little bit more. I'm so glad you've, you you touched upon culture there because people, and I read a lot about this, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or other interviews, similar, you know, webcasts and stuff like this, webinars, et cetera. And they think that culture is just a tick in the box uh-huh. that you can just bring it across with you from, from you know, year to year or, or and I always use the example of it's a, you know, it's a hundred thousand piece jigsaw, which is never complete. You, you're never going to complete it because yeah. you know, you're always changing. You're always growing, you know. Well, that, and, that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's 100 percent correct. I mean, growing sustainably and keeping that culture, that is the biggest challenge in, in whatever yeah. way I look at it. Um, you know, and what we are, you know, exceed is growing quickly and, and that's great. But that is, for me, getting us to grow sustainably. So taking our employees with us, supporting our customers, um, looking at what the market is doing on a, you know, because I say it's exciting in the HR and tech space at the moment, but actually that brings a challenge as well, because, you know, you're constantly going out to the market to work out what the product has to do in 12 months, 24 months time. Um, And it's changing pretty quickly at the moment. So there are loads of challenges, but that's what I love. So it's fine. And, and again, you've just you've, you're, you're taking the words right out of my mouth in terms of the the, the, the next question I have here. Um, obviously, as Exceed partners, uh, Phase Three know all about your kind of upward trajectory and and all the great things you've got coming along. But for those who don't, what can we expect to see from you guys um, in the next kind of 12, 24 months? Well, I think I've probably, we've probably talked about a lot of it. I think um, probably anything that that we haven't. So we will see continued sustained growth from Exceed. Um, we will look to to build out our partner network as we've really focused on um, in the last nine months. Um, and, and thank you for being one of those partners. Um, I think what we'll also see, as as well as the employee experience, well, I suppose it's part of it, employee engagement, more of that going into the um, the product. I think it's becoming the case more and more with all all software that we're part of an ecosystem now. So whilst I talk about a single solution, when I talked about it five years ago, um, I would have talked about the fact that it was all your data in one place and people knew where to go, et cetera. I think now um, it's still the, it's still all the data in one place because I passionately believe that that's crucial if you want to make the most of it and manage your people efficiently from a looking after them engagement type of way. I think what's happening now is we're seeing that um, you've got to accept that your solution is part of an ecosystem. So, you know, I, I said earlier about using an app at home to book my leave, but actually, you know, I might want to book my leave using when I'm on Teams. You know, I spend my life yeah. in, in Outlook, as I'm sure you do. Actually, I might also want to book it when I'm doing when I'm doing something in Outlook. So I think, you know, accepting that our solutions are great as single repositories and can be used like that. I think they are also getting to the stage where we absolutely need to accept that they need to be part of the general business ecosystem as well. And some of that function, you know, you might not kick off your pay run from Outlook, um, but you certainly (laughs) might want to book some leave or something like that. So I think looking at the wider um, ecosystem that we exist in and making sure that we play very, very nicely with that is is going to be really exciting over the next 12 to 18 months, chat links as well and things like that. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, guys, if you want to get on uh, the Exceed website, get honestly, the, the software is fantastic. Arrange a demo. Get in contact with us at Phase 3 if you want to arrange a demo. We're, we'll gladly do that for you as well. Um, we're going to move on to the, the quick fire round um, now. I don't know why I call it a round. It's not a quiz, is it? But, <laughs> it sounds, sounds like a battle. Yeah, you don't win anything. But, I don't. <laughs> okay, the answer's right or wrong. Um, but so these are just some, some random questions I'll pick just to uh, see where you're, where you're at, okay. uh, Simon. So let's go. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? 
listen more than speak quite simply okay yeah two ears one mouth all that okay yeah. Yeah. excellent okay um what's your what's the, i mean i'm looking at your your fantastic bookshelf behind you so i've got to ask you the question about what the last book is that you read uh so the last book i actually it's just here um it's uh, the machine okay uh, yeah, it's about um, it's about designing a sales function and a radically different way of doing it um, by a guy called Justin Roth Marsh. Um, I'd never read anything by him before, okay. um, but was uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting actually, really thought provoking. Do you have a preferred kind of genre of books or anything, or you, anything that takes your pick? So I, I suppose in terms of business books, um, everything I read is about um, technology or scaling businesses quickly. I'm afraid. Yeah um yeah. so yeah there, there's some obviously yeah, we all know the, the the absolute standards but there's some great stuff out there um and so yeah that's generally what i read i don't find that i read a lot of um fiction anymore right. um, um in my own sort of personal life um but um i do do read a lot of books about dog training as well but that's another story <laughs> okay um who's your favorite superhero my favorite superhero the Invisible Man. The Invisible always, Man. Okay. Yeah, I just, I don't know if he's a superhero or not. I think he is, but I just, I just, the, the ability, I think, and, and especially as a CEO, I think the ability to, I don't, and I don't mean anything like spooky about spying, yeah. but I think sometimes you get different messages um, and it would be lovely at times just to be able to really hear what people actually think about something either you know what they think about exceed what they think about our software without you being there that would be so powerful i think yeah there's that show isn't there uh, coming on tv where the md or a ceo of a business goes into his own business um i forget what it's called yeah um, I, have, I, don't, I don't watch i must confess i watch hardly any telly um yeah. but um, i have yeah i've heard of that one yeah that would be always, really quite spooky wouldn't it i always think i'd like to have a business that big where people don't know who I actually am. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about you, Sam, but I don't think I get away with it now. I don't. Well, I, I know I certainly wouldn't get away with it. Uh, not even in disguise. Uh, right. There you go. Okay. Um, who's your sporting hero? Now I made a huge assumption that you're that you're kind of into sports uh, uh, there, but wow, that's um, crikey, that is a massive question for me. I'm massively into sport. Okay, uh, good. Uh, rugby. Um, rugby, football mainly. I'm one of those odd people that like both football. I like both, yeah. There's not too many rugby, Although I only like, for some reason, I only like international rugby and I only really like club football. I'm a Liverpool fan, so, um, and have been, and you can tell from the Scouse accent, can't you? Um, have been since I was five and I walked into school, my mum and dad were in the forces, and I walked into school in Cyprus. Um, and within a very short period of time, uh, the biggest lad in the thing came up to me and said, who do you support? Not obviously with that deeper voice. Um, <laughs> and uh, who do you support? Is it, you know, is it Leeds, Man U or, or Liverpool? Um, you know, it, it could have been a disaster. I could have chosen Man U. Um, so, uh, hey, easy, yeah. easy, Simon, easy. Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I chose Liverpool for no apparent reason at that time, yeah. um, but I've followed them pretty passionate ever since, really. So in terms of my sporting hero, it, that is a tricky one. So um, oh, that's really tricky. But it, I, Ian Rush always had a massive impact um, on me because of that time of my life when he was... Uh, playing for Liverpool and he was just a striker a bit like Robbie Fowler after him who yeah. just seemed to be able to put the ball in the back of the net from literally yeah. anywhere I, I suppose a bit Lineker-esque for those who probably don't know who Ian Rush is um, <laughs> but, um, and if it was a if it was a rugby um, I think for me it would be Clive Woodward because he delivered the the World Cup to I mean I think his transformation was amazing. On a, on a very topical Liverpool conversation that's going around the the, the pubs and clubs at the moment. Um, what do you make of Salah? And and uh, it was it Jamie Carragher who said um, he makes it into his all time eleven. Uh, and you just mentioned Ian Rush, and obviously football formations have changed, and it was four four two, now it's four three three, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, would 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 Salah or any of the existing kind of players get into your all time Liverpool team? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I'm obviously I'm hugely biased. <laughs> so um, my my son has actually stopped asking me questions about football, you know, about who's best. We used to do those. What's your top ten? And I'd I'd like fill it with nine nine Liverpool, um, and then add one sort of random. <laughs> 
player. Um, yeah, I think 100% Salah would. Um, you know, when you look at the goal he scored against City um, at the weekend, I mean, it's just, you know, even if I wasn't a Liverpool fan, you know, Amazing those goal. are the yeah. top defenders in the world. Um, and there just aren't many, you know, people talk about Messi and they and they talk about Ronaldo with good reason. But, you know, that if, if Messi had scored that goal, we'd be seeing it on every YouTube channel, everything. And I just think, yeah, he'd have to be in my top top 11. Yeah. OK, excellent. And then final question. Uh, what's your what's your most used emoji? <laughs> if you even use them some people don't use them I do. i'm laughing because um i i'm actually i i love using gifts as well on the but okay my most used emoji is um is the one on teams with the um the thumbs up yeah so he kind of goes like that it um, does so yeah, I, yeah i seem to use that a lot um i, I started it, realizing that the smiley one was getting a little bit boring after a while there's the laughing one there's the the finger the, the thumbs up there's a few different ones isn't there? i'm not massive yeah. on Emoji. Well, I'm not very original when it comes to emoji use. Um, yeah, I always give no, my I kids a lecture that. about yeah. you know using proper grammar and, and and everything when they're when they're texting me. They still don't. <laughs> uh, but that's just a sign of the, showing my yeah. age there, I suppose. Yeah, no, that would definitely be mine. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, Simon. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to to speak with me today. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll I urge people if you want to know more about Exceed, get on the website. Um, contact us. We'll happily arrange demos for you and, and, and let you know what it's all about. It's a fantastic bit of kit and software. Um, and yeah, Simon, thank you very much for your time and uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed it.